Hi everyone, Sal Khan here. Welcome to the Homeroom live stream. We have a really exciting guest today, Pedro Noguera, who is the Dean of the Rossier School of Education at University of Southern California. So uh, start thinking of your questions, putting them on the message board on YouTube or Facebook, wherever you're watching this. And we're gonna try to get as many uh, questions as possible to Dean Noguera about all things education, higher education, what's going on in K-12. I think all of that is fair game, whatever is of interest uh, to you. But before we jump into that conversation, I'll give my standard announcements. Uh, first of all, a reminder that Khan Academy is a not-for-profit organization. We uh, only uh, exist through philanthropic donations from folks like yourself. So if you're in a position to do so, please think about making a donation at khanacademy.org slash donate. Also want to give a special shout out to several organizations that uh, stepped up uh, when COVID hit and we saw that our costs had gone up because we were seeing 250% of normal usage and we were trying to accelerate a whole series of programs. So special thanks to Bank of America, Google.org, AT&T, Fastly, Novartis, and the many other funders at all levels, including many of y'all, uh, for helping keep Khan Academy going. Uh, we continue to need your help. So once again, if you're in a position to do so, please think about making a donation. Uh, last but not least, reminder for everyone about Homeroom with Sal, the podcast, uh, wherever you can find your podcast. It's an audio version of uh, some of the highlights from uh, this live stream that you can consume safely in your car. So I encourage you to check that out. Uh, so with that, I'm excited to introduce Pedro Noguera, Dean of the Rossier School of Education at USC. Pedro, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Sal. Great to be with you. So there is a ton to talk about. Maybe the best place to start, I mean, I want to talk about, you know, given you're in higher education, but you're in higher education at the School of Education, I think you have a really interesting lens on both higher education and K-12. Big picture, where do you think we are on the COVID crisis in education? Uh, you know, is what what's going to be the main damage done and what are the big opportunities? Wow, so so much damage. Um, we just released a report today uh, from USC showing the impact of virtual learning on kids just in the LA area. And there are still thousands of kids who have, you know, uneven or real total lack of access to virtual learning. And that's not been corrected. And I'm not faulting the district because they did and have gone to great lengths to try to get screens to kids and to connect kids to the internet. But um, we still have lots of communities across the country, uh, particularly in rural areas, but the urban areas as well, where there's no internet service. Um, so it starts there, there's just no access. Then we have the fact that there are, you know, as we know, many affluent people are able to put their kids into learning pods, they get higher private tutors, they're independent schools where kids are coming back. Um, that's not happening for kids who are dependent on the public schools, especially in um, our low income districts. So the disparities that were there before the, uh, the, the pandemic are going to be worse after. And I guess two questions, is there anything we can do to help mitigate some of that damage or if we're not, how do we deal with it once we, we do normalize whenever that might be? Well, you know, I, I start uh, by just reminding the viewers, you know, all along, several of us have been saying we have fixated on the wrong thing. We were calling this an achievement gap when we should have been always framing it as an opportunity gap, right? That is mm -hmm. that kids need the opportunity to learn. <laughs> and, and, and that means once you frame it that way, then you start to look at the conditions under which teaching and learning occur. Those conditions have been very uneven and all our fixation on test scores has never addressed that. We never have made sure, for example, that kids have access to capable teachers, that they're in schools with lab equipment and, and, and uh, libraries, basic things that kids need. And now we have the issues of access around uh, online learning. And again, if you're an affluent kid and something is hard, you can get a private tutor, you can go on a, a, a Khan Academy, um, now, hopefully Khan Academy is available to everybody, but there are a lot of kids who don't have those resources. And so my hope is that policymakers will become much more attentive to these gaps in opportunity that are pervasive throughout American society. I mean, speaking about the opportunity gap, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you know, the digital divide is is the most obvious one, especially during COVID, when you need that to just even be able to access your potential. But even outside of COVID, if 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 you have even a handful of kids in the classroom who don't have internet access at home or proper internet access, the whole classroom's not going to be able to take advantage of of 
personalized learning tools or, or whatever else. Uh, and then, you know, I was surprised. I remember several months ago reading a report uh, that a majority of minority majority schools don't even offer high schools don't offer a lot of the courses that we take for granted in a high school. And when they do offer it, they don't cover it at the same level of rigor because their expectations, arguably, whatever, something's going on. They might not be having the same level of equipment. They might not be having um, the same level of expertise among some of the, the faculty. We don't know. But these kids aren't getting the opportunity to even engage at, at that level. What do you see as the major levers? You know, if, if you were secretary of education or emperor of the universe, what would you do to help close that? Well, I think it has to go beyond Secretary of Education. I think um, the federal government, state governments should be leaning hard on the high tech companies. These companies are the richest companies in the world right now and have gotten richer even during the pandemic. Uh, you think about Amazon, Facebook, Google, these companies are massive, they're large. They have to, a social responsibility to invest in the infrastructure that allows access. Um, if you think about it, telephone service um, would not be available in rural areas if we just saw it as a cost. We recognize that there's a basic need and right to communication. And so therefore we do have cell towers and telephone service, even in the most remote uh, rural areas. We need that kind of um, a commitment to access uh, to basic services uh, around the country. And I think the federal government has to lean in and we might need legislation, but we've got to figure out a way to uh, make that possible because it it not only is it about learning opportunities but as we know we rely on the internet for everything now and uh to see so many people cut off is i think again a reflection of the deep and persistent inequality in our country no and you're absolutely right and all of the opportunity gaps that need to be filled i mean the most obvious one especially during covid is clearly the digital divide and i mean any sense you know we're signatories to this connect all students campaign that uh, common sense media is doing and you know my back of the envelope calculations are you could connect all the families that are not connected in the whole country for one percent of one of the rounds of stimulus that we're that we're <laughs> so it feels like the most obvious thing in the world to do and it yeah. economically empowers people probably even improves their health outcomes because they'll Absolutely. get access to information and and yeah. what and, and and whatnot what what's your view um from how what, what are teachers seeing and feeling and how might you know do you think what we're seeing in covid is it's just a covid thing or do you think there's certain aspects of teaching or schooling that might be forever altered because of what we're going through i, I i'm well i think I was just on a call yesterday with some teachers in Texas, in San Antonio, and many of them, their primary concern was the mental health needs of kids mm. uh, and the stress that they're seeing their children under, kids who are not going outside, kids who are um, depressed and, and anxious because of the climate in the country and um, worried about the long term effects and consequences of that. Um, you also have the same kinds of uh, stress on teachers. Um, just think about the teachers who are juggling kids at home while they're expected mm -hmm. to do um, Zoom instruction. So unfortunately, when you're preoccupied with those things, how do you get creative on the use of Zoom uh, and, and online platforms to provide really high quality instruction? There are some schools that are doing that. They provided the support and guidance to teachers. But I, I think that that's not happening nearly enough. And, and so what we're seeing is many kids who get, um, they're, they're discouraged, they're not motivated, they're burnt out from too many hours online, um, and uh, they're giving up. And that worries me, especially for the older students who should be preparing for college right now. No, that 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 makes a ton of sense. I mean, what if you, you know, we're able, we have a lot of teachers who watch this, you know, what's your... What, what what would you tell to them? I mean, as you as you just described, there's a lot of stressors going on, and and they're trying to they're doing heroic efforts. What what would you what advice would you have for them to kind of you know navigate all of this? I, I would strongly encourage them to go on to Edutopia. <laughs> um, that's my favorite platform uh, because they provide very practical guidance to teachers on first of all how do you provide social and emotional support to kids in an online medium? How do you design good lessons um, K through 12 in a variety of subjects for kids that can get kids engaged and 
to help kids to develop their skills and 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 ensure that learning is occurring. Um, so you need those kinds of hands-on um, tools available for teachers. Uh, many districts don't have the resources to provide it. So unfortunately, it falls on the back of teachers to figure out where can I get the help I need. But there's help available there, and I didn't really encourage. Uh, you to go check it out if you're a teacher out there listening. Edutopia. I don't get paid, so this is not a this is a free commercial. Uh, I just think it's no. Great. They're they're a not for profit. That's George Lucas's um, <laughs> That's effort, right. Foundation. Uh, and I'm I'm also a a very big fan <laughs> of them. So so we're 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 aligned there. What what do you are there going to be um, some fallout? I mean, we we've talked about some of the the negatives that are going to happen over, I mean, frankly, we're already happening pre COVID and if anything, COVID's making it worse around, you know, yeah. opportunity gaps and digital divide. You, do you think that, you know, people have, you know, obviously your traditional standardized state assessments have had to go on hold because of COVID uh, teach, you know, every teacher I talk to, they're thinking about how do they use zoom in a more interactive way. Uh, people are getting creative in terms of breakout sessions, you know, use of things like Khan Academy. Do you think that some of this is going to, you know, people are, uh, right now are doing hybrids where even if, you know, when they are coming back to school, there's going to be some kids that are still home. So how do you support both? Do you think any of that stuff is going to last post COVID or do you think we're just, we're going to go back to, to what we were doing before? That's a good question. And something I've been thinking a lot about, I think ideally this disruption should serve as an opportunity to do things differently and hopefully better than we were before, that we don't just return to schools as we knew them. Um, for too many kids, school was not a place where they felt supported, where they felt stimulated and challenged. We need that to be the primary focus. If, if you think about it, uh, and I just did a conversation with the former Secretary of Education a few days ago, No Child Behind got us fixated on achievement as measured by test scores, which then directed teachers to prepare kids for tests. Uh, that to me was such an, uh, a disservice to education because what we know is that teaching when it's powerful should be creative, it should uh, be stimulating, it should be engaging, it should uh, uh, be meaningful. Uh, and you know, as a former teacher myself, I taught in Providence, Rhode Island when I first started, uh, I taught history and I loved history. Uh, and I knew then that my job was not simply to cover the textbook. My job was to make history come to life so that students would appreciate and, and want to learn more history. And that, that's the message I often tell teachers, you know, we know we're doing it right when kids want more, right? That's the way knowledge works. You want more once you start to realize the power of knowledge. Well, that's what we've got to come back to. We've got to redirect the attention of our teachers their job should be to get kids excited about learning, to focus on motivation, to focus on making it meaningful, um, rather than simply covering material and assessing to see if kids got it. That, that to me was, um, I mean, I get it. We needed the evidence that kids were learning. We just focused on the wrong things. And you feel that, you know, post COVID, there might be some opportunities to rethink this because some of the traditional kind of testing structures have or at least they've been paused in some That's of the right. state assessments. And and also in this ESS, um, every student succeeds, we replace no child behind, gives states more flexibility to do things differently, to do formative assessments and performance-based assessment. So we don't have to allow the assessment itself to be the driving factor. But what I see is that in several states, um, I don't see the vision or the knowledge about how to do things differently. And that worries me. If you look at the independent schools, they're already doing it differently. Um, many of the affluent public schools are. Um, where, where we see the problems is in the schools serving low-income kids, which are over half the kids of the, uh, in the country today. That's where we see the kind of kill and drill approach um, that I think leaves many kids alienated. No, it makes sense. So we have a question here from a, a teacher, Christina Espinoza. Good day, Dr. Noguera. I am a teacher in the Sweetwater Union High School School or High School District. Currently, we are teaching 100% virtually and serving students from extremely diverse backgrounds. Since we see students through, throughout several zip codes from a rather affluent East Chula Vista all the way down to the border, we cannot have a one-size-fits-all grading policy. How, from your experience, should we approach grading? Mm, good question. And uh, hello to the folks down in Sweetwater. They have literally hundreds of kids, I think, each day who 
at least when schools were open, were coming across the border to go to school. Some kids getting up at three in the morning to get to school. So I just want to acknowledge um, uh, the, the efforts of those kids and the educators who serve them. I think grading all along, and I've been uh, struggling with this as a university professor for many years, you know, the, 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 what we forget is the real learning is not in the grade you earn, it's in your ability to demonstrate how much you've learned. It's the work you produce, right? So we should be using grading to give feedback to students, meaningful feedback on how to improve. And we should be treating work as um, uh, in an iterative manner. That is the real learning occurs through the revision, right? Uh, of getting it, getting it right or getting it improving upon the finished product. And so uh, what, what always has concerned me about the way we do grading in schools is kids get fixated on the grade. Some kids want the A, and so they'll aim for the A. Some kids just want to pass. And what we should be more concerned about is the learning. How much have they learned? What, have they, what can they share with us and demonstrate as proof of what they've learned? That's what we should be looking at. And that's what, to the degree that we need to affix a grade at the end, we should grade the evidence of growth, evidence of mastery. Um, because when we don't focus on that, what we end up with is kids who are pushed along grade by grade, who have a weak foundation, who can't do very much, end up in college, can't write, can't do research, even though they passed. And that is a huge problem. I couldn't agree more. You know, one of the things that I, I talk a lot about is 70% of kids that show up at community college have to take remedial math, which you know is not a euphemism for 11th or 12th grade math. It's pre-algebra. It's sixth or seventh grade math. So the whole system, to your point, year after year, kids promoted, they get 20% wrong on dividing decimals, they get 30% wrong on exponents, those gaps just keep accumulating. At some point, the algebra is hard, they start watering it down for them so that they have the illusion of progress. You get to college and they're saying, you're not even ready to learn algebra yet, which is really a ninth or 10th grade subject. Uh, and, and those kids, all of them are capable because we get letters from them every day when they go back and fill in their gaps. They're all capable of it, but it's incredibly disheartening. And we know that's like the... That's the weeder uh, or the best predictor of not succeeding in college is having to show up and having to take non-credit bearing remedial courses. You, you know, I mean, with, with that lens, how do you see and, and, and everything that we do at Khan Academy is, is trying to facilitate mastery learning. So I love your, your view there. But what's your um, sense of college? You know, there's a question from YouTube, Hari Aburu. Do you think college will change in the future because of the pandemic? Oh, college is going to have to change. And the main thing that has to change is the cost. You know, it's out of reach for too many people. We have too many students that have to take on debts that they'll, you know, incur and, and, and be paying back well into adulthood um, because the, the cost of college has gone too, uh, too high. Um, so we've got to figure out how to reduce cost, how to increase access, but also how to improve teaching. So it's, it's very easy. You know, we often... Um, in the conversations about teaching and the critiques, we focus on K-12, but I would say some of the worst teaching I see is at the university level, where the primary mode of teaching is still lecture. And, and lecture, um, even if you're a very good lecturer, is not the most effective way for students to learn something. Um, we need to know, um, real, get the evidence again. Evidence-based teaching is much more interactive. Uh, let me just use one example going back to math and algebra that you gave. When I was in eighth grade, uh, I took algebra with uh, my teacher, Mrs. Harris, in, in, in New York City. And Mrs. Harris uh, started class by saying, you kids are lucky because I'm the best teacher in the school. She said, tell me who out there uh, in this class struggles in math. And very sheepishly, I raised my hand because I was fine in arithmetic, but algebra was uh, had thrown me uh, for, a, uh, for a loop. So she said, you kids are going to sit in front because I'm going to check on you throughout the day and every day to make sure you're with me. Because she understood that if you didn't get it in September, you certainly wouldn't have it by June. Mm -hmm. She was constantly looking at our work. She wanted proof that we got it. She was inviting our questions, not to embarrass us, to, but to make sure that we were with her. It was interactive. And because of that, I came out of that course much more confident about my knowledge and understanding of math. When we teach that way, um, in that kind of interactive way, when we recognize that teaching and learning are connected, and, and the Khan Academy does this better than I think most people, then what teach, learning becomes 
uh, an exercise in, in, in acquiring and becoming and, and getting ownership of the information, material, the skills, uh, instead of a passive experience of sitting through lessons. And that, I think, is the biggest change at both the university and at the K-12 level that we need to bring about. No, it's fascinating because, you know, these days during COVID with everyone learning on video conference, everyone's like, how do we make it engaging? Because kids are going on different window video uh, windows and, you know, and everyone's saying, yeah, you got to ask them questions. You got to be on top of them. You got to pull them out of the screen, put them into breakouts. And, but, you know, it's always like, but, you know, by the way, that's also a good idea when you're in a physical classroom. <laughs> exactly. Too. And your point about, your point about mastery learning, it sounds like you had a great teacher who intuitively got that you can't let these kids have the gaps because it, it becomes a self-fulfilling self -fulfilling prof prophecy. If if you don't know how to dribble, you can practice free throws all day. You're not going to be a great basketball player. Uh, but somehow, you know, the the, the system, you know, and I, I don't blame the system because it's, you know, it's the best way we knew how to do it 200 years ago, but there's now right. way. And we oh, well, to actually, to your, <laughs> to your point, your teacher was able to do it with pretty low tech. So maybe we could have done it right. a little bit different. Uh, and think a, about what a while she said. Ago. She said, I'm the best teacher. And best teacher, her, her meant not that she taught the best kids. Best teacher meant she could teach all kinds of kids. See, and that's yeah. also a shift in the way we think about teaching. There are a lot of people out there who think they're good, but they're only good with kids who don't need help. <laughs> they only want to teach honors. They only want to teach AP. <laughs> they don't want to teach kids who struggle. And that's part of the problem that, you know, real teaching is about helping to make it accessible, make it um, uh, get it, help kids to get it. So I think the shift needs to occur on both ends in how we deliver, but also how we how we engage students. If I could just use one analogy, if you watch kids when they're playing a video game, right, a new game. If they need help, they don't get it. They go on YouTube. They call a friend. That's part of learning then they're making mistakes because that's part of learning too. You learn through your mistakes and then they advance. They advance because they get better and better and then they master the game. That's the way learning occurs for kids. And that's what we should be replicating in our classrooms, a version of that. I couldn't agree more. That's, you know, that's what we aspire exactly to, to help facilitate. There's a good question here from YouTube, Nish786. Uh, you're widely known for your work on equity, race, and poverty issues in education. How do you see social emotional learning fitting into those areas? If schools aren't addressing racism, they aren't fully addressing trauma, in quotes. How can schools better align their work in these related areas? So, you know, one of the things we've known, all teachers know this, kids learn through relationships. Kids will learn from teachers they know care about them, who are invested in them. And caring doesn't mean we have to be best buddies. Uh, my teacher, Ms. Harris, wasn't my best buddy. She let me know that if you're in my class, you're going to learn, you're going to work, right? She was that warm demander. Um, racism gets in the way of that because it often results in lowered expectations. It results in strained relationships. Uh, and, and sometimes you, it results in teachers who don't see themselves as, as being invested in the learner, taking responsibility for whether or not this, their students are actually learning. So uh, um, I think it's important that we, we, we have an equity mindset um, and we recognize that professional educators have a, a moral and professional responsibility to educate all their students, right? And if they can't, they need to let someone know, I've got a kid in my class who's not learning and they need to call for help. To do anything less, in my opinion, is a form of malpractice and, um, and, and teachers should not be complicit in allowing kids not to learn. When you see kids end up in high school or college yeah. who haven't learned basic math, that means they were educators all along the way who saw it and did nothing. And what advice would you, you know, I, I think everyone agrees intellectually, but if, you know, you can imagine a, you're a ninth grade teacher, you have five kids in your class that are, you know, barely struggling. You kind of water it down for them. They barely, you know, scratch by on a C. You know that they're not, they're going to be those kids who have to take remedial math if, if they even get to through high school and, and get to college. But, you know, that teacher's feeling like, hey, there's 30 kids here. I got to do what I can. I told the administration, the administration's kind of, you know, saying, look, that's the way life is. Like, how does someone, re you know, from from a teacher's point of view or is it does it have to happen at a systemic level H how do we make sure that that you know that there are ways to support those kids you know truthfully it's hard for a teacher by themselves to affect system change right 
they can change what's happening in their classroom. They can create the climate in their classroom where kids feel supported and engaged. Um, and they, and, and you know, the truth is and, uh, that when the classroom door closes, the teachers have a lot of power, uh, at least when we're in a physical space together. Um, but to, to bring about real system change, you need leaders, principals, superintendents who understand that we've got to become better at intervening early with kids, better at, at providing, you know, some kids, as you know, Sal, need more time than the traditional school day allows. So we need to find ways to create more time as well for the for kids and subjects that take more time to, to, for them to learn. Yeah, it's always blown my mind that slow is equated with dumb when oftentimes <laughs> the kids that just need a little more time, they're, they're, they're really trying to internalize it. And, and, and if they have a strong foundation, they're going to race. And we see that at Khan Academy all the time in our own data. So I uh, couldn't agree with you more. That, that, that equation is really flawed and it makes kids even think that they're not smart when they're fully right. capable. You know, one yeah, of the know. attributes that kids most frequently cite as being valuable to them from a teacher is patience. You know, the mm -hmm. teachers who are patient and giving them the chance and teachers who are organized <laughs> in how they present <laughs> the material. <laughs> no, I remember when I was tutoring my cousins, I mean, I tell the story all the time that when I first made some of those videos for them, uh, they told me famously that they like me better on YouTube than in person. And, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think part of it, and, and I always try to parse what they were saying, because they weren't saying they really appreciated having me as like a, 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 a real person who was invested in them. But I think the video comment was really about the patience that they they, they, they didn't feel the pressure to learn it right in that three minutes that they could come back to it, et cetera. They had multiple right. they opportunities. They could pause the video and then t pick it up again. You know, that's because again, that's how we learn. And we all, we don't all learn at the same pace. No, couldn't agree more. So, you know, the time we have left any, you know, we have teachers watching this, we have students, we have a lot of parents, and obviously everyone's got a certain level of anxiety these days, above and beyond what they normally would have had. You know, what uh, advice do you have about where education is going, how people should navigate it? You know, any big takeaways? Yeah, I, I'd say right now we have to um, use, again, use this disruption to start thinking about what kind of schools do we want to create? What kind of classrooms do we want to create? Start, visualize what the end should look like. You know, imagine schools where kids were excited about learning, where they were happy to come each day. What would it take to create those kinds of schools? And let's start planning for that. Let's start planning schools where relationships are valued, where we are thinking holistically about the needs of kids, the academic, the social, the emotional needs of kids, because they're all integrated. And let's start thinking about how to really organize schools to meet the needs of our students. Um, if we did that, then I think we would end up with very different schools than we have now. No, could, couldn't agree more. And what I always stress is, you know, people view me as a technologist, but I don't view myself that way. I always say, never use technology for technology's sake. Always think about what is the goal. And 99% of the time, the, the best possible resource is an amazing in-person teacher for your child. And if technology can help unlock what that teacher can do, personalize more, fill in gaps, mastery learning, then, then that's all good. But technology has to be in service to the humans and in service to those goals. Absolutely, I agree, couldn't agree more. Well, well, uh, Dean Aguera, thank you so much for joining. I mean, this is one of those conversations I think we could continue for another several hours, but I'll, I'll let you go for now. Uh, but, but thank you so much for joining, this is really valuable. And so I want to thank you for the service you provide to kids throughout the country and making um, education and knowledge more accessible. And um, I, I think you, you've provided just a tremendous resource to so many. So thank you. No, well, it's a lot more than me, but I, re I really appreciate that. And I'm going to follow up with you. I think there's ways that we could work together. That would be great. All the best. All right. Yep. Thank you. Thank so, you. So uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Uh, as always, uh, you know, Dean Noguera was really great. Um, and I wish we had another, you know, five hours to chat because this is obviously a really big subject, but hopefully uh, y'all got as much out of that as, as I did. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, just a couple of announcements. We're going to have um, my next uh, live stream. Well, well actually, I, I was on this document that I was looking at, but now it disappeared. Uh, but we're going to have that webinar with um, our chief learning officer. Uh, I believe it is. Oh, there it goes. All right. Yeah. On uh, seven tips for motivating middle school and high school kids during distance learning. This is going to be October 22nd, 4 p.m. Pacific time. I highly recommend it. You're going to really enjoy Kristen. She's our chief learning officer. Not only does she know almost everything uh, to know about uh, learning science, uh, but she's also really 
really engaging. <laughs> so, so I think y'all will really enjoy that, that webinar. Uh, so with that, I will see y'all uh, at the next, uh, the next homeroom live stream. Talk to y'all later.